Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Amber Hagerman? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing you in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Amber Hagerman was born in Arlington, Texas, on November 25, 1986. Her mother is named Donna Williams and her father, Richard Hagerman. Donna was only 18 when she became pregnant with Amber. Richard was 34 years old at that time. Four years after Amber was born, Donna had a son named Ricky. Allegedly, Amber's father, Richard, had a long history of excessive alcohol use and was occasionally violent. Neighbors would frequently call the police. On one occasion, the police told Donna that if they had to come back one more time, Amber and Ricky would be taken away from her. This was one of Donna's worst fears, and she was determined to avoid that outcome. She moved out of Richard's residence with her two children. She lived in her car for two days before moving into a shelter. The workers at the shelter helped her to find an apartment and to obtain welfare. Donna still had contact with Richard occasionally, but did not intend to reunite with him. She was still afraid of him. A local media outlet wanted to produce a documentary about single mothers on welfare. They had trouble identifying anyone who would participate, but eventually they located Donna, and she agreed to be featured in the documentary. In August 1995, a film crew started recording Donna, Amber, and Ricky in Donna's apartment. On November 25, 1995, the crew recorded Amber's ninth birthday. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On January 13, 1996, Donna visited the Arlington home of her parents, Jimmy and Glenda Whitson. Donna had taken nine-year-old Amber and five-year-old Ricky along on the trip. They arrived at the house at about 3 p.m. Amber and Ricky wanted to ride their bikes in the neighborhood, which they often did, when they were at their grandparents' house. They were given permission, but told to stay inside the neighborhood. They started riding at 3.10 p.m. Amber and Ricky did not follow the rules. They rode their bicycles to a vacant Winn-Dixie grocery store parking lot outside the neighborhood. It was two-tenths of a mile from their grandparents' house. The grocery store had a ramp near the loading dock, which they would ride their bicycles on. Ricky became uneasy because he knew that they were breaking the rules. He told his sister that they should return to their grandparents' house. Amber agreed and said that she would be right behind him. Ricky rode his bicycle home, but Amber did not follow him. Instead, she was kidnapped from the parking lot. At about 3.20 p.m., a 78-year-old retired machinist named Jimmy Keevil was standing not far from the parking lot. He saw a man in a black pickup truck grab Amber and drive toward town. Jimmy immediately notified the authorities. He described the kidnapper as white or Hispanic, under six feet tall, medium build, with brown or black hair. Jimmy said that Amber screamed and tried to kick the kidnapper. The pickup truck was a full-size fleet side with a short wheelbase. It was probably manufactured in the 1980s or 1990s. It had a single cab. The rear window was one piece. It was not a sliding rear window. The truck was not damaged and had no chrome on it whatsoever. It was all black. The police immediately started searching for Amber, but they did not have success. Here's what the police found during their investigation. A lot of people in the area owned black pickup trucks. The police tried to track down as many as they could. Amber's father, Richard, was cleared as a potential suspect because at the time of the kidnapping, he was captured on video surveillance somewhere else. The police became suspicious of a man named Mike Thompson. He was a friend of Richard's who inserted himself into the family's business as far as interacting with the media. Mike also owned a black pickup truck. The police checked out his alibi and determined that he could not have been involved. He was making deliveries in his pickup truck several miles away when Amber was kidnapped. In addition, the witness to the kidnapping said the perpetrator forced Amber into the truck. Mike knew Amber. He would not have needed to force her into his truck to kidnap her. 
On January 17, a man walking his dog found Amber's body in a creek three miles from where she was abducted. Her throat had been cut. The police found no evidence of an assault of a sexual nature, no defensive wounds, and no signs of restraint. They believe that Amber was murdered on January 15, two days after she was kidnapped. The man who found her was cleared as a potential suspect. Amber's killer has never been caught. The task force which had been created to find her was disbanded in the summer of 1997, after it spent over $1 million on the investigation. Donna Williams would eventually get married. Richard Hagerman died in 2007 after struggling with alcohol consumption. A child abduction emergency alert system called Amber Alert was unified across the United States under the PROTECT Act of 2003. This system quickly provides information to the public when a kidnapping occurs. The name of the alert system is not only a reference to Amber Hagerman, but it's also an acronym, America's Missing Broadcast Emergency Response. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts in a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one, Investigators were in a tough position as far as solving Amber's murder. The description of the pickup truck offered by the witness was detailed, but there are a lot of pickup trucks in Texas. This would be like trying to narrow down a suspect in Congress by saying, it's the politician who lies. Despite this, I'm a little surprised that the police could not identify any suspects with that detailed description of the truck. Maybe the witness was incorrect about some of the details, or the perpetrator immediately disposed of the truck or changed the truck's appearance. It stands to reason that the kidnapper lived in the Arlington, Texas area, which does narrow down the search somewhat. However, in 1996, the population of that city was about 300,000 people. There was a laundromat not far from where the abduction took place. There were no windows in the laundromat facing the right direction for people to see the kidnapping, but a black pickup truck matching the description given by the witness, had been seen outside the laundromat right before the kidnapping occurred. The police desperately wanted to speak to the people who were in the laundromat, but those people were illegal immigrants. They fled the scene right after the kidnapping and refused to cooperate. The police would later promise not to deport them, but the illegal immigrants would not provide any assistance at all to investigators. The police have not released all the information they have in this case, it's possible that they recovered some DNA from Amber's body because they have expressed an interest in new DNA testing technology. It appears as though they're in this situation that occurs in some cold cases where they only have a limited amount of genetic material and they're concerned about using it up with tests and therefore not being able to take advantage of more sophisticated tests in the future. Item number two, when the task force investigating Amber's death was still in place, a woman came forward and claimed that she saw the kidnapping. She even had a partial license plate from the black pickup truck. The woman's statements led the police to questioning a man and searching his house, but there was no evidence connecting him to Amber's death. The police started to become suspicious about the woman's statements. Eventually, she admitted that she never witnessed the abduction. She was lying the entire time. She said that she felt bad for Donna and wanted to give her hope. The authorities decided not to prosecute her for providing false information. Item number three, when the victim of a child abduction is recovered safely, the government uses the term successful recovery. There are two main variables that predict a successful recovery. One, the actions of law enforcement, meaning the police actively investigating the case and trying to find the child. And two, the relationship between the victim and the perpetrator. Strangers and acquaintances are the types of perpetrators who primarily represent a threat to the victims. Other types of perpetrators typically do not harm the victims. For example, family members, babysitters, or criminals who steal a vehicle without realizing a child is inside. A child is about seven times more likely to suffer harm when a stranger or acquaintance is the perpetrator. When this type of perpetrator commits a child abduction, the victim is in an extreme level of danger. In 53% of these cases, the victim is killed within one hour. In 75% of the cases, the victim is killed within three hours. Item number four, 
The Amber Alert system is often thought of as something positive that came out of a terrible story. The government claims that the system has saved over a thousand kidnapping victims. This claim is not supported by the evidence. It's not clear that the Amber Alert system has even contributed to one successful recovery of a victim. Almost all the cases that have Amber Alerts result in successful recoveries. This has led the government and other advocates of the Amber Alert system to associate Amber Alerts with successful recoveries. They are inferring a causal relationship, like the Amber Alert led to the successful recovery. Research indicates something different. Amber Alerts have been shown to be largely ineffective. There is actually no evidence that suggests they routinely save lives, although in rare instances, theoretically, they could be helpful. If an Amber Alert is issued in a case which has a successful outcome, that does not mean the Amber Alert caused the outcome. It's much more likely that other variables explain the success, like the two variables I mentioned before, the actions of law enforcement and the relationship between the perpetrator and the victim. Item number five, why is the Amber Alert system ineffective? There are several reasons. I will cover a few here. The police are unable to organize and communicate information fast enough to make a difference. Only 15% of successful recoveries occur within three hours. There are many false Amber Alerts, which occur due to a variety of circumstances. Many Amber Alerts do not actually involve any type of kidnapping at all. For instance, a babysitter takes a child, doesn't communicate well with the parents, a divorced father with visitation rights picks up a child on the wrong day, and the mother thinks the child has been kidnapped, or a child might be hiding from the parents deliberately, like there never was an actual perpetrator involved. These false alarms are devastating to the effectiveness of Amber Alerts. The system has been overused, which causes people not to pay attention to the alerts anymore. The public has lost confidence that the alerts will actually lead to a victim being saved. The success of the Amber Alert system is dependent on operators who evaluate criteria and decide which cases get an Amber Alert. These operators must determine the mental health and personality factors involved with the perpetrators, there is no way they can do this accurately. They don't have magical powers. The problem is that not enough information is known early in a child kidnapping case. After the fact, it's easy to determine which cases met the criteria, but at that point, it's not helpful. Item number six, some people defend the Amber Alert system by asking the question, isn't the system worth it even if one life can be saved? Well, as I mentioned, it's not clear that it has actually saved even one life but I think the larger issue is that all programs must be subject to a cost-benefit analysis. For instance, if the government put everyone with even one perpetrator tendency in prison for life, that would probably reduce abductions significantly. But is it worth the cost? Everything is a trade-off, and there is no easy solution. It appears as though the Amber Alert system has been given a pass as far as rational evaluation. It is allowed to exist outside the realm of scientific analysis. No program should have this type of immunity. Amber Alert is an interesting idea and one that makes people feel good. But the reality is that dangerous perpetrators are simply too fast for the system to make a difference. There's another argument out there in favor of the Amber Alert system, which says that, okay, maybe Amber Alert doesn't actually contribute to successful recoveries, but perhaps it functions as a deterrent. I think this is highly unlikely considering that many highly tangible consequences like prison do not always deter crime. I think that most kidnappers are not going to worry about the public receiving a text message containing their license plate number. Again, these perpetrators strike very quickly. They don't need much time to conduct a kidnapping or to commit homicide. Now moving to my final thoughts. When unthinkable tragedies occur, it's natural for people to want to prevent them in the future. There are often strong reactions to heinous offenses. Occasionally, these reactions are not rational and lead to ineffective programs like the Amber Alert system, programs which provide people with a false sense of security. It's important that resources be used in ways that are effective. With some offenses, like stranger abductions, the key to greatly reducing the frequency is prevention. This is not satisfying to people whose children have been taken. 
but nonetheless, it is the reality of this particular type of crime. Those are my thoughts in the case of Amber Hagerman. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.